Hogwarts Legacy is one of my most anticipated games this year, and judging by everything we've seen thus far, it's much bigger than we thought. The game is simply riddled with things to do, collect, and secrets to find that we absolutely have to cover before playing it. So put on your wizarding hats, hit that like button if you enjoyed this video, and let's dive right in. Now the story of Hogwarts Legacy brings us to the 1800s. Our character is a fifth year student who holds the key to an ancient secret that threatens to tear the wizarding world apart. Despite our late arrival at the school, our abilities will soon be tested as things aren't as they seem. With the suspicions of a mounting goblin rebellion and an uneasy alliance with the dark wizards, the very safety of Hogwarts lies in the balance. That's why it's up to us to protect it, perfect our magical powers, learn from the best professors and occasionally befriend other students who we can bring on adventures with us and uncover the truth. The world outside of Hogwarts isn't any safer either. In our journeys, we'll be met with many dangers lurking in the shadows and creatures corrupted by dark magic, but also plenty of opportunities to explore. Throughout all of this though, we still have to attend the classes and learn about subjects such as charms, study against the dark arts and herbology to name a few. All which coincidentally will teach us valuable new things, useful both in and outside of combat. Now the word legacy in the game's title is not coincidental either, as the choices we'll make along the way, be them good or evil, will define who our characters become. The first big choice we'll make is, well, simply deciding on how our characters look like. That might be a bit more challenging than at the first glance though, as there are seemingly dozens of options to choose between and even more deeper in the menu, including face features, colors, hairstyles, eyeglasses, you name it, all the way to the tone of your voice, character names, and the very dorm you get to sleep in. Now, if you worry about choosing your student house, that actually comes in a bit later through the ceremony of the sorting hat, except you'll be in full control which of the four houses you want, be it Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, Ravenclaw, or even Slytherin. Later on, when the game opens up, there will be plenty more opportunities to further customize more than just our looks. For example, the village of Hogsmeade will hold many shops and vendors that can provide us with access to all sorts of extra gear, but open world exploration and quests will equally be just as rewarding. Once the faction decision is made, it is being made for good and will further bear on your journey from that point on. One of the biggest first consequences is the common room you get access to. And think of this as your own secret layer where you get to meet other students from the same house and possibly perform other tasks as well. Each one comes with its own unique style, from its entrance all the way to its most secret corner. Gryffindor, for example, is probably my favorite because of its more royal look, closely followed by the Ravenclaw's elegant accents of silver, gold, and blue. I'm not going to lie though, my first character ever is likely going to be a Slytherin, given the fact that there's a whole underwater area teased over there, but also mostly because I just like playing with evil characters. And finally, also the cozy, almost hermit-like design of the Hufflepuff for those who enjoy it. All of these will have unique matching robes and masks that you can fully represent with the house of your choice. We don't know yet the full extent of some of the other gameplay effects, like we did see for example some mini games possibly teased, but there's like a lot of hopes for deeper effects, like extra quests, dialogues, and who knows, maybe even exclusive rewards. On the other hand, the choice of who you want to be as a wizard will have a broader impact on the overall gameplay, which can include access to additional skills. The final game will feature 26 usable skills in total, including the 16 slottable combat-related ones and 8 remaining utility used in certain areas or to facilitate exploration. Each one of these skills will have distinctive effects and the game heavily encourages you to use combos, whereby combining multiple spells in quick succession can result in devastating outcomes. This is further made easier with the spell diamonds that you get to unlock at various points in the game, which are these grids next to your spells that you can quickly slot some of these spells into to fastly switch between them in combat and cast these faster combos. A lot of them are learned at certain stages in the main story, while others are tied to your own choices and also through side content, such as avoiding or not to learn Crucio, an unforgivable curse, from one of the other students early on. As you might imagine, such a scenario opens up a dilemma. Do you pursue power at the expense of someone else's well-being, or do you find another way? This kind of choice might result in different outcomes, but can also lock you out of accessing that particular spell. 
and some of the other more powerful unforgivable spells, including the Killing Curse, can be quite tempting for the first time player with its massive potential. As we've seen from the recent gameplay footage, the team really held nothing back when it comes to making this curse as strong as it sounds. Maybe even stronger since there is a whole section in the skill tree dealing with the dark arts to reduce the cooldown even more and make it even more devastating. In all cases, I don't think you'll ever feel left out even if you don't choose an evil path, as the game will feature a skill tree useful enough to heavily alter the effects of all your existing skills likewise. Not just the dark arts, but others like for example turning your measly incendio spell into something truly amazing that spawns a conflagration around your character to better remind your enemies not to get too close. These aren't the only combat moves, as there's plenty more mechanics to help you out. One of them is called Ancient Magic, and there's a couple of spells here that we've seen, including the ability to pick off objects from the environment and then smash them into the enemies using R1. This can prove rather useful at dealing with enemy defenses, as there's certainly an element of strategy involved here. Just like how offenses are key, being on your toes and using Protego to both block and eventually reflect its back is just as, if not even more important than that. Then we have the ultimate attack, castable with both bumpers once the combo meter is filled, which can have different effects depending on the enemy you cast it on. Some get one-shotted with devastating attacks, while others get morphed into farm animals and whatnot in a pretty hilarious kind of scenario. And finally, there's the various potions and charms that you get to craft and bring with yourself in combat once you've gotten them from the room of requirement. They provide different effects in combat, like for example turning yourself invisible or making your skin solid, just as rock or even better, making your vision so that it reveals hidden objects. Meanwhile, some of the plants are great at crowd controlling enemies, while others spit unholy substances or straight up just bite at your enemies. The choices here are as plentiful as there is no shortage of ways to approach combat. Once you get the build going though, there's a few ways to test your new skills. The earliest is at the school's not so secret dueling club that the students help put together. You can take part in trials or challenge other students in combat by speaking with Luke and Bradley back at the castle. This will teach you the basics of combat, but eventually will bring you with more advanced challenges, which will be definitely worth it for some of the extra rewards that you get at the end of them. But if you want to step it up a notch, then there's at least one more thing that you can do, and that is to step in the combat arenas. There's at least three of them that the game will feature, of which two are accessible by everyone, while the remaining one is the Dark Arts Arena, which only comes with the Deluxe Edition or as a separate upgrade should you choose that later on. For example, we saw the former recently accessible through the Dark Woods, and this will let you test all the skills in the game, even the ones that you did not unlock yet, like for example the Dark Arts spells. I just wonder how that plays lore-wise if we choose a non-evil playthrough though. But we talked about doing stuff inside of Hogwarts, let's take a peek into the outside world. There's many reasons to venture beyond the castle's walls, and the biggest of them all is definitely exploration. The world of Hogwarts Legacy is alive, and filled both with small and slightly larger clusters of wizarding civilization. The biggest area outside of the school is the Hogsmeade Village, which will serve as a nice one-stop place to grab supplies, gear and upgrades from the various shops inside of it, some of which we ourselves might end up help creating. On top of that, throughout the world we'll find these smaller settlements named Hamlets, where other wizards and witches meet up for drinks, provide us with quests, puzzles and other interesting interactions. Many of them are set to provide exclusive gear that we can't get otherwise, so they are at least worth checking out. If, on the other hand, something of greater mystery is what you need, then checking many of the other objectives, underground caves and dungeon-like passages could work even better, including many partially submerged and otherwise hidden areas like the ones teased in this shot. Finding and even solving these secrets will require a bit of wit, but mostly boils down to your ability of waving your wand to cast a revealing spell or manipulate very heavy objects out of your way. Another thing that I really like actually is that the game features more than a day and night cycle and further incorporates seasons. As the school year passes, you will also feel the passage of time. The outside world, including the plants and the trees, will change drastically and provide a completely different vibe with each season. 
back at Hogwarts, new festivals and decor changes will also be visible to remind you that the world you live in feels very much alive. But moving on, open world also means a lot of open space, and traveling through it is a whole mini game in and of itself, with the mounts we'll get access to being the highlight of it. The flying broom is just one of them, and this already features a unique mechanic, like for example the closer you are to the ground, the faster it will let you fly, but you can also sacrifice some of that speed to gain more altitude instead. It's also possible to upgrade the broom to give you more wiggle room with this, with plenty of upgrades, including cosmetic ones that you can find at various vendors. On the other hand, some of the other mounts don't have such restrictions and might have other advantages. For example, the Hippogriff and the Thestral mounts are some of the best when it comes to both on-ground traversal and also quickly jumping into flight mode, but might not feature a boost mode. Recently, we also had a glimpse at the Grabhorn mount, a fully ground level mount that, instead of coming with flying abilities, has the one to charge through enemies and throw everything away from its path. That's likely going to add a lot more in terms of mounts that we haven't even seen yet, and who knows, maybe we might even get to tame some of those dragons. Most of our school time though, outside of attending classes or interacting with other students to complete quests, will be spent at the Room of Requirement back at the castle. This is the place where we do most of our crafting, upgrading and yes, creature maintaining as well. Almost everything in this Room of Requirement is customizable, from the overall theme all the way to the items placed inside of it and even its rooftop. Not all items have a decorative purpose though, some even have gameplay effects such as using planters of various sizes to grow different plant types that can easily be used in combat, or the mixing pots that let us mix and brew different potions, among many more. Then there's also the loom, this is where we upgrade our gear for higher qualities, boost its stats and also slot in interesting passive modifiers that we get to find out by exploring and completing content. But before you can do any of that, we do need to pay a visit to the identification station and identify the traits of the gear we just got before we're even able to do anything with it. Now in the same room of requirement, we get access to one more feature and that's the vivarium. We had a full look at the first one, but there's at least two confirmed such places from the same room of requirement, one teased in a swampy area and another one with a strange moon glow coming out of it. This is the place where we get to store all of the creatures that we saved during our adventures. Some of these creatures get saved during story missions or other side content, while others by paying close attention to these creature paw icons around the map and saving them from poachers. This feature goes deeper than it looks by the way as you have to also care for your companion while being to make sure that they are happy, clean and well fed. Later on, some of this can be done both manually, but eventually you can build all kinds of contraptions to automate the entire process. One feature we did not see fully yet, but it was teased, is the creature breeding. This is done via the breeding pen that we saw at one point in the gameplay reveal, but I'm also hoping that it goes a bit deeper, like providing us with ways to affect the looks and possibly even the stats of whatever comes out of it. In any case, the game comes out on February 10th for the PC and the new gen consoles with a 72 hour early access if you happen to get the digital deluxe editions. For the old gen consoles and the Switch versions, unfortunately, they have been delayed recently until April 4th and July 25th respectively, so there's quite a bit of waiting until then. If you're also interested in gaining a 72 hour early access to the game, you can also take part in some of the giveaways that we're doing here on the channel. I'm going to try to do one every single week here for any platform you want to. All you have to do is to be a subscriber of the channel as that's the only way you're going to get notified by it. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video.